Hello everybody and welcome back to Satisfactory. My name is Dakoba and today we are taking a look at trains and how to build a train network in your Satisfactory world. We're going to start off with a quick time lapse of how we built this network and then we'll go through how it works and talk about some other things we can do with these trains. Everything we're going to be doing today is timestamped in the description below, so let's get into it. And that is our train network all complete. Let's go through how it works. First off, our network adheres to two simple rules, and as long as we keep these consistent throughout the entire network, we shouldn't have any major problems with trains navigating and avoiding collisions. First off, trains are only allowed to travel down a given track in one direction. That is to say that there will never be a piece of track that allows travel in either direction, with one minor exception that we'll cover in just a little bit. For our dual track line, this means we have a right-handed system, which means trains sort of travel forward on the right-hand side and backward on the left-hand side. If we turn around, the trains are going to travel forward on the right-hand side and backward on the left-hand side. This makes sure that trains never encounter a head-on collision, and it also goes a long way to avoiding deadlock, where two trains are sort of waiting for another to pass. Secondly, anytime we have a piece of track that two trains may want to share, we use a very simple system for ensuring that they're able to flow through it correctly. And that is that we use a path signal for every entrance and a block signal for every exit. So here, for example, we have an intersection. This is this intersection has a single entrance train that's trains coming sort of down this main line here. And so we have a path signal that marks the entrance to this intersection. Now, as trains come into the intersection, they, they pick a path, either left or right. And both paths are marked with a block signal. So here we have the block signal that marks the right hand path. And if they and we're actually standing on the block signal that marks the left-hand path there. And this is repeated for every single intersection throughout the network, no matter how simple or complex it is. Let's take a look at another example. 
All right, now here we have a slightly more complex intersection. This intersection allows trains to come down this path line and then either enter this station or, or bypass it. Now we adhere to the same rules. As they enter the intersection, they pass a path signal on the right hand side. That marks this intersection as a path block, which means trains aren't allowed to stop here. So they're only gonna enter the path block if they have a way out. Now from this entrance, they have two possible exits. First, they can turn left and enter into the station. And so we can see that that exit has a block signal on the right, or they can hook right and proceed along. And so we also have a block signal on the right there. Now this station is called the terminal station and it's the only case where we allow a train to travel in both directions and we, they require a bi-directional train in order to use. That's a train that has a locomotive on each end facing in opposing directions. The train can pull into the station and then back out of it in the opposite direction. But this actually cr makes this intersection a bit more interesting because this then counts as an entrance into this intersection. And since we don't want them to go right, we don't have any signals that mark this as a valid path, which means from this entrance, they do have a path block on the right, but they only have one valid exit, and that is to pass straight on through through the block signal we had set up. Finally, here we have one of our loopback interchanges, and we have several of these throughout the network, but this is a place where the trains can change direction along the main rail line. Now we treat the entire interchange as a single large intersection, which means as the train comes in, they have a path signal on the right that marks this as a path block and forces the train to determine what path it's going to take through the block before it enters it. We also have a path block at the opposing entrance that allows the trains there to do the same thing. Now from either of those entrances, they have the same exits. A train entering here can proceed straight through the intersection and out the opposing side, so we have a block signal marking the exit of the intersection there. Alternatively, it can hook right and turn around, and so we have a block signal marking that exit. A train coming from the other direction can also proceed straight through, or it could turn around, and so it uses the same exits as trains coming from the opposing side. So we treat this as a single intersection with two entrances and two exits. Now, as long as we adhere to these same rules as we continue to build the network, this network should have no trouble expanding to almost any reasonable size. And this is one of the best things about train networks. In addition to the fact that train lines carry power, the ability to plug new stations directly into the existing network and expand to new areas makes logistics a breeze. All we have to do is set up a new station at whatever location we want, and then modify the timetables to allow either a new train or an existing train to make use of that station, but connected to all of our existing networks, which means that no matter where we need to send trains, as long as the network is set up correctly, it's all connected. And it really feels like wherever we go to build, we're just building an extension of our base. The entire map is opened up to us because of this. Now, when building this network, there were a couple of things that I had to sort of keep in mind as I was laying out the tracks. First of all, when you're building ramps, you wanna to stick to either the one or two meter ramps. The four meter ramps are too steep and trains can struggle to climb those. Second, when you're laying tracks side by side, you want to make sure that there's enough clearance between them, the trains traveling in opposite directions won't clip into each other. Trains are pretty good with their hitboxes, but they're not great, and I found that this is a, a reasonable distance that's, uh, that's easy to sort of gauge and measure, and also make sure that the trains will never sort of accidentally clip into each other and collide when traveling in opposing directions. Outside of the main line where I've spaced this out very carefully, I'm only using single directional tracks, which means that collisions really just aren't an issue at all as long as I've got my intersections all signaled up properly. The last thing you need to keep in mind as you're planning a train network is how you're gonna organize cargo for trains that have multiple carriages. For example, we're gonna be using this train station here as a source and destination for our crystal oscillator factory, which we're gonna be building on this platform here in just a minute. Now, in order to do this, we're mining some quartz in the cave and shipping it up via train line in order to unload here. Now, this is where things get interesting. Each freight platform can be set to either load or to unload, but not both, which means we need two freight platforms because we're gonna be unloading the quartz here, so we have to have an unload platform, and then we're gonna be loading in the finished crystal oscillators, so we need to have a load platform as well. Now where things get interesting is figuring out how we want to organize our cars. Because we're shipping the crystal oscillators from here back to main base, that means that the position of the loading platform 
here has to match the unloading platform at main base, which is the sort of front platform. So this has to be our loading platform. This is where our finished product is going to go in. That means our unloading platform has to be the second one. And that means that we have to build the station in the cave where we're mining that quartz to sort of match this one. And so we have to sort of work backwards from whatever the final destination is through the requirements of each station down the line in order to come up with a plan for the full leg of the network, as well as how the train itself is constructed. Now it is worth noting that train stations have gotten much smarter in Update 5, so you can often make do with a single loading and single unloading platform at each station. You don't need to worry about having specific cars dedicated to single products, for example. All right, I wanted to show you guys something that happened while filming that time lapse. Uh, and this is what sort of allowed me to build this train line is that I was poking around down here and I, I actually came in from the other side and there is a cave here that runs all the way from uh, sort of over near the great Northern Bay area there uh, through the Rocky Desert underground. And there's a couple of quartz crystals right in the middle of it. And we've actually built a train line that runs the length of that cave and comes out here. Now, I'm not sure what causes this glitch. I'm doing this in multiplayer, which may be where it's at, but you can see I have not cleared these rocks. Um, and that's because we haven't researched Nobilisk yet. We don't have the explosives to clear rocks yet. But as I was exploring this cave and came upon these rocks, um, I noticed that I started to like glitch through them and that was unexpected to me. And it turns out that um, on a second account in multiplayer, uh, you can just sort of like walk right through these and and it's a little stuttery it's a little glitchy uh but there's nothing that stops you from just like walking right through these rocks and and building a train line right through them and trains don't clip with them so it all works fine um this is a little bit of an abuse and it's not something i generally like to do but i really wanted to run this train line and we're gonna clear these rocks out anyways uh so eventually we'll come back through here with novelist and just delete these but uh but for the time being we're just going to sort of glitch through these rocks and pretend that this path has been cleared out uh, because we were able to do that and with our train network all squared away let's dive into our crystal oscillator factory now i'm not going to go through the design for this i actually put out a video using this exact design just a few days ago. So there's a link to that in the description below if you're curious. For now, we're gonna jump straight into the build. Let's get into it. Thank you. 
All right, and with our crystal oscillator factory all complete, I think it is time for us to move on to the last couple things we want to work on today. All right, now one of the first things I wanted to show you guys is something I have set up here on the side. This is going to be how we launch off the next space elevator. I know we said we were gonna build a bigger factory and in a way we have, um, but we had all the components we needed just stockpiling up. So I went ahead and set up storage containers and moved those components over by hand, set up manufacturers for our uh, adaptive control units and our modular engines and then just refilled the storage containers. I've actually refilled these storage containers once already. So I think we're about halfway through our versatile frameworks and we should get the other half there. I think we've got about four hours left based on how long this has been running. So that's something that we should finish before our next episode. So maybe we can send that off to start the next episode. For today though, I want to head on over and take a look at the hub and take a look at our remaining milestones. Now we only have a couple of milestones left that are available to us, and those are gonna require some work. First of all, we're gonna need pipeline engineering. For that, we're gonna need copper sheeting, plastic, rubber, and heavy modular frames, and we have all of those on hand. Uh, and then second, we have gas masks, which will take rubber and plastic, again, something very easy to do, and fabric. Now we've managed to get the alternate recipe that'll allow us to automate fabric, but we haven't actually set up a factory for that. So that's something we're gonna do probably in the next couple episodes. I have a plan for, for making use of some crude oil veins for a new power plant, and we are going to take some of the leftover polymer resin from that and turn it into fabric. For now though, we're probably just gonna craft up 50 fabric out of the mycelia and biomass that we have stockpiled and get this milestone sent away. All right, and we can send off our gas mask. And with our pod returned, let's go ahead and send off our next milestone as well. And with that drop pod away, I think it is time for us to start winding down for today. In our next episode, we're going to be building a new power plant. I went exploring between episodes and managed to find a bunch of hard drives and got some alternate recipes. And notably, one of the ones that I got was the diluted packaged fuel recipe. Now this can be used for a large scale power plant. So our goal is going to be building a 20 gigawatt power plant using the diluted packaged fuel recipe. This is gonna make use of the packager and a bunch of refineries, and we'll have to tap some new oil veins for this. So I'm very excited. This is gonna be a very big build, but we need it because if we take a look at our power grid, you can see that we are actually well below our consumption and we are burning through our excess power. That that crystal oscillator factory, as well as all of our train networks, have really taken a toll on our power consumption, and so we are going to have to ramp that up in a hurry if we want to avoid brownout. So I may disconnect parts of the factory just to tide us over until then, but we're going to get that power plant up and away in our next episode. And that's going to do it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Leave a like if you have, and subscribe if you'd like to see more. My name has been Dakoba, and I hope you have an efficient day. I'll see you soon.